Hey everyone and welcome back. Today, instead of investigating a certain part of the world, we'll be taking a trip back in time to a grim stretch in history, the Dark Ages. It harbored some of the world's most despicable acts and villainous people. Often swathed in tales of witchcraft and devilry, there are several long forgotten, but nonetheless ruthless killers who acts made our modern day terrors look like amateurs. But real quick, before we get into this medieval nightmare fuel, I've got a quick announcement to make. I've opened up channel membership, so if you're a fan of the channel or would like to engage more with myself and other like-minded people, go ahead and join up. We have one level of membership at the moment and it includes perks such as custom badges, shoutouts and videos, sneak peeks of upcoming videos, and more. Now, let's get into it. It was said that Nears was a master black magician who could render himself invisible and transform into a cat, a dog, or a goat. And it's believed that he garnered these powers through the cannibalization of the unborn, of whose hands and feet he kept inside a leather pouch that was carried with him at all times. It's no wonder then why the German robber bandit has since been solidly rooted among some of the worst serial killers in history. This is the tale of the medieval boogeyman. Niers was born into a peasant family in the 16th century Germany. During the heyday of serfdom, Niers saw firsthand the struggles of rampant classism. No doubt, the inhumane living conditions and treatment of the peasant class were a catalyst for his later sociopathy. Niers' murder spree took place in the aftermath of a countrywide peasant uprising that began in 1525. The peasant revolt led to a long period of unrest and chaos, and as a result, crime rates in Germany soared. Surviving records reveal that murder accounted for anywhere from 11 to 15% of the country's crime. And it was from this backdrop of violence and chaos that Peter Niers emerged. Niers formed a gang of his own in Alsace, France, a town situated in the middle of the conflict. It's believed that Niers was inspired by fellow murderer Martin Steer, a shepherd and murderer who organized 48 fellow shepherds into a gang of bandits. Steer and his gang claimed to have traveled all the way to the Netherlands. After a 22-year crime spree, Steer was executed in 1572, but not before mentoring Niers. Niers and his rotating group of 24 bandits terrorized the European countryside for years as they stole from and murdered travelers on remote highways. The gang would split up to target smaller attacks or band together to take down larger ones. Eventually, the gang became so emboldened that they marched into towns and villages to murder, pillage, and attack citizens for their goods. Niers' gang traveled hundreds of miles across southern Germany, western France, the Rhineland, and Bavaria. Their widespread network of crime extended the stories of their misdeeds across Europe and created the lore around Peter Niers and his crimes that persist today. In 1577, Niers and members of his gang were captured for the first time after 11 years of crime. One of Niers' accomplices had turned them in and Niers was consequently tortured. He reportedly confessed to 75 murders, some of which explained several accounts of missing local women. Though it's unclear how he did it, Niers somehow managed to escape his first imprisonment and avoid execution. Soon after, the stories of his terrors reached folklorist levels of gore. Pamphlets, books, and songs about him were circulated and featured cannibalism, black magic rituals, and supernatural abilities. According to a collection of pamphlets by Johann Wick, possibly the first ever true crime reporter, the killer summoned the devil in the woods near Flasburg, France, and called on these powers to complete his crimes. Historians reported that German black magic practitioners from this era believed candles made from unborn skin and fat allowed for invisibility and other supernatural powers. Niers is said to have used the skin of his victims to create candles that allowed him to break into homes undetected, where he would hack off victims' hands and feet, then cut out their hearts and eat them. Legend also maintained that cannibalizing the unborn could give one the ability to transform himself into a log, a stone, or an animal. As a black magician, it was believed that Niers acquired an appetite for infanticide. In 1581, Niers' tenure as a serial killer would come to an appropriately disturbing end. By this time, Niers was well known across the country. He attempted to hide in plain sight when he stopped at a lodge in Newmarket called The Bells and asked the local innkeeper to hold his leather pouch so he could visit a bathhouse. This would prove to be his undoing. 
As Niers enjoyed his bath, the townspeople confronted the innkeeper to open the leather pouch. Inside were the dried hearts and hands of fetuses. Realizing these were the possessions of a black magician, the townspeople knew to whom they belonged. Niers was easily captured in the bathhouse, much to the shock of the authorities. Many believe Niers was so easily arrested because he was separated from his magical objects, which were believed to make him invisible. Niers surrendered and confessed to an astronomical 544 murders that included 24 pregnant women. The Newmarket executioners gave Niers a taste of his own medicine by delivering an especially violent death upon him. For three days, Niers was tortured. On the first day, Niers was stripped naked and restrained, then slowly, strips of flesh were flayed from his body, and after what was most likely several hours of being skinned alive, boiling hot oil was poured into the wounds. On the second day, Niers' feet were greased and his feet were forced over an open fire, slowly roasting them. Finally, on the third day, Niers was strapped to the braking wheel. This infamous medieval torture device was a large wheel designed to break bones and crush someone to death. His legs and arms were ruthlessly crushed, snapped, and broken, leaving him on the brink of death. Only at the end of the third day, some semblance of mercy would be shown to Niers when the executioner hacked off his shattered limbs, causing Niers to finally bleed out and die. On October 28, 1589, Rhenish farmer Peter Stump was declared guilty of having practiced black magic, being a serial killer and a cannibal, and most of all, being a werewolf. It was one of the most lurid and famous werewolf trials in history. Some sources of information on Peter Stump vary, but around the year 1590, a pamphlet of about 16 pages was published in London as a translation of a German print. The document describes Stump's life and all alleged crimes as well as his trial. Stump was born in the village of Eprath, near the country town of Bedburg. It's believed that the name Stump, or Stumpf, may have been given to him as a reference to the fact that his left hand had been cut off, leaving only a stump, in German, Stumpf. And as the werewolf allegedly had his left forepaw cut off, this would only work to solidify the public's view of his guilt. According to the judiciary at the time, Peter Stump committed at least 16 murders, rapes, and incest over a period of 25 years in Eprath and Bedburg in the guise of a werewolf. He was also accused of sorcery and living with a she-devil. In 1589, Stump faced one of the most famous werewolf trials of history. Stump was stretched on a rack and heavily tortured before confessing to have practiced black magic since he was 12 years old. Stump claimed that the devil had given him a magical belt or girdle, which enabled him to transform into, quote, the likeness of a greedy, devouring wolf, strong and mighty. Removing the belt, he said, made him transform back into his human form. For 25 years, Stump had allegedly been an insatiable bloodsucker who gorged on the flesh of goats, lambs, and sheep, as well as men, women, and children. Largely in part of these medieval interrogation methods, Peter Stump confessed to killing and eating 14 children and two pregnant women, as well as their unborn child, which he later described as dainty morsels. One of the 14 children Stump was accused to have killed was his own son, whose brain he was reported to have devoured. Next to the accusations of being a serial killer as well as a cannibal, Stump was accused of an incestuous relationship with his own daughter, who in obvious Dark Age logic was then also sentenced to be executed with him. Additionally, Stump confessed to having had sexual relations with a succubus, which was sent to him by the devil. The execution of Peter Stump took place on October 31st, 1589, and became known as one of the most brutal recorded executions in history. Stump was tied to a wheel, then pincers were placed into burning coals until red hot and they were then used to peel flesh from his body in a reported 10 different places on his torso and numerous others on his arms and legs. After this excruciating torture, his limbs were broken with the blunt side of an axe head to prevent him from returning from the grave. Finally, he was put to the axe and beheaded, and his body and head were burned on a pyre. His daughter and mistress had already been flayed and strangled, and were burned along with Stump's body. 
As a warning against similar behavior, local authorities erected a pole with the torture wheel and the figure of a wolf on it, and at the very top, they placed Peter Stump's severed head. Even if there had been nothing else unusual about the Breton nobleman Gilles de Ray, his outstanding career as a soldier in the Hundred Years' War and as a comrade in arms of Joan of Arc would have been enough to guarantee his place in history. Today though, those achievements can only be seen in the shadow of the secret life he led as the perpetrator of more than a hundred gruesome child murders, a rampage which made him arguably the first serial killer in recorded history. The early life of Gilles de Ray was marked by tragedy. Both his parents died in 1415. His father, Guy de Laval, was killed in a gruesome hunting accident that de Ray may have witnessed, and his mother, Marie de Crayon, died of an unknown cause, and he was raised by his maternal grandfather, Jean de Crayon. As a young man, de Ray seems to have been impetuous and hot-headed, characteristics that translated well to the battlefield, where he was by all accounts a skilled and fearless fighter. When Joan of Arc appeared on the scene in 1429, he was assigned by the Dauphine to watch over her in battle. The two fought together in some of the major battles of her short career, including the lifting of the Siege of Orleans, and largely in part of these heroic battles, in 1429 he was appointed to the position of Marshal of France, at the time France's highest military distinction. His military career began to wind down with the death of Joan of Arc in 1431 and he spent more time at his estate, which was amongst the richest in western France. De Ray spent his fortune recklessly, paying enormous sums for decorations, servants, and a large military retinue, and his sale of family lands to finance his extravagant lifestyle sparked a bitter fight with other members of his family, especially Jean de Crayon who pointedly left his sword and armor to Gilles' younger brother René when he died in 1432. In later years, de Ray seems to have been increasingly concerned with religion and his own salvation. In 1433, he financed the construction of a chapel, quote, for the bliss of his soul, which he called the Chapel of the Holy Innocents, in which was staffed, horrifyingly in the light of de Ray's crimes, with a boy's choir, selected by de Ray himself. He also investigated the occult as a means to save his rapidly collapsing finances, employing a succession of alchemists and sorcerers. Meanwhile, rumors had begun to circulate. Children had gone missing in the areas around de Ray's castles, and many of the disappearances seemed to be connected to the activities of de Ray and his servants. Because it was common for young boys to be permanently separated from their parents if they were taken on by nobles as servants or pages, some of his victims' parents would have been truly unaware of their children's fates. In other areas though, de Ray's murderous predilections may have become something of an open secret. It came out during his trial that witnesses had seen his servants disposing of the bodies of dozens of children at one of his castles in 1437. But the families of the victims were restrained by fear and low social status from taking action against him. De Ray wasn't arrested until September 1440 when he kidnapped a priest after a dispute that was unrelated to the murders. He was then tried concurrently in ecclesiastical and civil court for a range of offenses including heresy, sodomy, and the murder of more than 100 children. Under threat of torture, de Ray confessed to the charges and described ritualistically torturing dozens of children kidnapped by his servants over a period lasting nearly a decade. He was sentenced to death by simultaneous burning and hanging, and the punishment was carried out in Nantes on October 26, 1440. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you're not already. Stay safe out there.